Uh, you just stole my first line, so making the introduction slightly more difficult. Uh, yeah, but so Evergrande, as mentioned, is facing about, well, at least $300 billion of debt, possibly up to $450 billion, because there's a lot that is probably hidden. And this crisis is very reminiscent of the subprime mortgage crisis, which, of course, led to the world financial crisis. And so the Chinese government is facing the same kind of dilemmas that the US government and the European governments faced uh, about 13 years ago. And how they respond to this, whether or not they decide, for example, to bail out Evergrande or even nationalize it, will reveal the real nature of the current regime. So what is Evergrande and why is this happening? Well, <clears throat> China's boom, at least for the last 12 or so years of it, uh, has been fueled to a very large extent by a property boom or property speculation, which makes up a massive 30% of Chinese GDP by now. And many, many property developers, most of them probably, of which Evergrande is, is the largest, borrowed unsustainable amounts in order to participate in this speculative boom in an attempt to get ahead of their peers, you know, to outcompete each other, to grow as quickly as possible. They borrowed and borrowed and borrowed. Um, and now, of course, the consequences are, are here. Um, in fact, Evergrande, and I think some other companies, I think this is a widespread practice, started borrowing even from their own employees in an attempt to, sorry, to, gain, uh, to gain more capital more quickly. One particular model that they have, which demonstrates the feverish, short-sighted uh, character of this boom, is the so-called 3691 model, which refers to the need to start developments within three months of the plans being drawn up, to start um, off-plan sales within six months, so to start sales of the properties before they've even been finished, and to finish construction within nine months and then return the money with interest to the banks within a year, hence 3691. And it's no surprise that many companies are going bust because you can see with that kind of turnaround, it's not really going to be sustainable. And the reason for that, uh, the reason for the need to turn around so quickly is because of the huge amounts of debt they have taken up on. I've been told to speak more loudly, but I think I'm going to start having to actually shout, which is going to be a bit awkward. Um, so yeah, the entire industry was borrowing unsustainable amounts of money uh, on the assumption that house prices, property prices, would just perpetually go up, which of course sounds very familiar to, to many of us. The industry's total debt is thought to be, according to Goldman Sachs, around $2.8 trillion, or 18% of Chinese GDP for one industry, which is uh, a huge amount. But of course, if anything should burst that bubble, if, in other words, if anything should cause property prices to stop rising, then the entire model would collapse, uh, and that is what appears to be happening. The debt load would sink all of these firms, basically, which is what is happening to Evergrande. Uh, what it is, by the way, one of the biggest property developers in the world. It is the second biggest in China, and it has total liabilities. In other words, it, it owes, in total, 3% of Chinese GDP in what one company. That's how much it, it owes. It is the most indebted property developer in the world. And therefore, its collapse threatens the world's second biggest economy, and therefore, by extension, the world economy. But why is it collapsing specifically? Well, the Chinese government has sparked this crisis in reality because it's placed obstacles on, on, the, on borrowing, essentially. It started making it, created what are called three red lines, essentially, to taking on more debt, making it harder and harder to borrow more money. Uh, and therefore, of course, their whole business model is, is going out the window. And they need to borrow money to pay off the previous debts that they have. Um, and so what they're attempting to do, the Chinese government, is essentially to to have a kind of controlled explosion of this, this bubble, to let it down calmly before it gets too big and threatens the entire economy. However, it's not clear that that isn't already the case and that their attempt to do so is already spiraling out of control. For example, Fantasia Holdings, which is another property developer, has just, developed, uh, just defaulted on its debts. 
Modern Land, uh, a couple of weeks ago, another developer asked for an extension on its, um, on its repayments. Uh, and Cynic, and not spelled like a C Y, <laughs> it's spelled S I N I C. And also Fujian, Fusheng, two other de property developers, have also defaulted. So it appears to be widespread. Home sales by value fell in the year to September by 17%, and in the year to August by 19.7%. And in some cases, what we're seeing is uh, stricken property developers like Evergrande selling off their, um, selling off their flats with massive discounts of 30 or more percent because they're desperate to get access to cash. They've got to pay off these debts. They can no longer borrow more money to do so because of the Chinese government regulations. And so they're just flogging off their flats at below value in order to gain access very quickly to cash with which to pay off their debt. But of course, the effect of that will be to crash the property market because of all of these companies doing that kind of thing. Property prices will will go down, and that will further cause a crisis in the property sector of the economy. And of course, this cannot fail to have massive implications for the rest of the economy. As I said, it's 30% of GDP. In itself, that is vast. But they're all enmeshed with each other. Evergrande is not only actually a property developer, it also has a car manufacturing business. And of course, many Chinese companies that aren't property developers will own little bits of, of Evergrande and other companies, or will have lent them money. So it is a problem for the entire economy. That's the nature of capitalism in every country these days. There aren't really private companies that are just sealed off and owned by a couple of people. They, are all, they all own little bits of each other and are all mutually interdependent. Um, so its crisis will lead to a crisis in the entire economy. But why has property been such an important driver of the Chinese economy for the past 12 or more years? Given, you know, you'd have think they, that seeing that it was property and the, the crash of the, of the property sector which sparked the 2008 financial crisis, you'd think it's kind of a, a bit of a mistake to repeat that, that, uh, that policy. Um, well, if we go back to 2008, China actually briefly went into recession. I remember it at the time that millions and millions of workers were being laid off. Uh, and, uh, you know, it looked like a serious... You know, you know, basically part of the world crisis, and it was going to have massive repercussions for China. But in only a few weeks, uh, the economy started growing again, and workers started being hired. Why was that? It was because of the fiscal <laughs> stimulus that the Chinese government launched in 2008, which is possibly the biggest in history, or certainly one of the biggest in history. It was about $586 billion dollars of stimulus that the Chinese state pumped into the economy at that time in an effort to keep things going. And it did work, in a sense. Uh, and not only did it pull China out of recession, but it actually arguably stopped the world economy going into an outright depression uh, at that time, which is what it looked like it was going to do. Because the growth of the Chinese property sector in particular, that was a product of this, uh, led to a boom in raw materials uh, and in capital goods. So countries like Germany, uh, and Australia in particular, but many, many countries throughout the world benefited from this, countries that were selling things to, to China, basically. But the key thing is that because China was by now a capitalist economy, this was not done by means of a plan of production, but by means of debt, basically, a massive explosion of debt. Uh, and if, if China's companies were, in 2008, holding back investment and laying off workers, as I mentioned that they were, briefly, there was a good reason for it. It wasn't just a result of a sort of irrational, silly fear that some government money would dissuade them of, and then everything would be okay again. There were far deeper reasons for this. And that's because in the middle of a world financial crisis, one of the biggest in history, there's obviously a limit to how many Chinese-made things, you know, cars, smartphones, clothes, etc. There's a limit to how many of those things the world market can absorb, right, because of the, the, the crisis and workers being laid off all over the world. Um, and that doesn't go away just because the Chinese government starts lending a lot of money. The limited demand of the world economy, of course, remained. And therefore, if in its desperation the Chinese state starts lending a lot of money, starts basically drowning companies in cheap credit, which is what they did, 
these companies will, in general, tend not to spend it on productive uh, investments. In other words, on building new factories and taking on more workers for productive things. Instead, they would tend to spend it speculatively, right? And that usually means, and it did mean in China, uh, on a house, housing speculation. <coughs> now, um, so what happened is that all kinds of companies, including, importantly, state-owned enterprises, a lot of the Chinese economy remains state-owned, about 40% of it. Uh, but these state-owned companies do not work to a plan of production to meet social need. They work fundamentally to make profit. They operate like private capitalist companies. And so many of these companies, including them, if you look into it, they started up their own shadow banks at the time, semi-legal banks, basically, which they, you know, they were taking on all of this money from, from the Chinese banks that were state-controlled, um, and they were encouraged to, lend it, uh, to, to spend it. But what they actually did is they set up their own shadow banks and lent it themselves, in a lot of cases, to property developers, right? to get in on the action of the housing market because it was thought those prices would keep on going up. Um, and, uh, and, and actually, these financial arms of these companies were frequently more uh, profitable than their core business. As Marx explains, credit allows capital to go beyond its natural limits. In other words, to, sort of, to, to extend the period of boom. Uh, and, and delay the crisis. But it means that the crisis will still come on a higher level because that that, that those loans have to be paid back with interest. And, of course, it generalizes that crisis as well. It's the nature of, the, of, of, of finance. And that is generally what has happened in China. As more debt has been issued, it becomes less effective. For example, it now is thought to take around about $4 of, of debt to produce an extra dollar of growth in the Chinese economy. Whereas before the stimulus, it was thought to take about $1.40 to produce an extra dollar of growth. The, re the main reason for this is because a lot of the new debt that is taken on is simply to pay off old debts that have proved un you know, unviable, essentially. In other words, a lot of money has been spent on what have ended up being ghost towns, or empty apartment blocks. Just the other day, in, somewhere in, um, in, uh, in Yunnan province in the south, they de demolished about 15 apartment blocks. They were just empty, um, and there was no real uh, demand for them. So there's, in other words, there's been a lot of you know, feverish economic activity, which, yes, does increase employment and spending, and it does increase the GDP figures, uh, but actually it's not profitable. It's not sustainable. <coughs> And, of course, then those debts need to be repaid, but there haven't been any profits with which to repay those debts. And what essentially has been happening is that instead of defaulting then and, and going bankrupt, a lot of people, a lot of firms, have been then borrowing more money in order to pay off those previously unsustainable debts. Therefore, what this has been doing is just delaying the crisis and extending it. Uh, and it means that there is an avalanche of bad debt waiting to be defaulted upon. Before 2008, I think Chinese debt, total Chinese debt, all of these figures are somewhat approximate, and a lot of them, you know, there's a lot of hidden debt. But it's thought that before 2008, all of the debt in China was equivalent to about 160% of GDP. By 2016, that was the most recent uh, figure I could find, it was 260% of GDP. By the way, back in the 70s, before China returned to capitalism, it was 0%. There wasn't a deficit. Uh, and it, so it's kind of an, an index of how developed capitalism has become in China and how developed the contradictions of capitalism have become. That the total amount of debt just keeps on going up and up and up, just as in, in the West, in fact. And again, I emphasize, it's important to understand that this stimulus was de uh, delivered by these methods that were guaranteed to produce a housing bubble, I think, in the circumstances. It did it by means of debt because it's not a planned economy anymore. So you can't just say, if you're not a planned economy, if you're a capitalist economy, you can't just say, well, we've got these amount of resources, this amount of workers, therefore we can produce this amount of stuff to meet need, and that's what we're going to do. You can't do that because you don't own the economy. The economy is in private hands, and those, sec those sections of it which are not in private hands still operate largely according to profit. So you cannot make them uh, do what you want to do. 
And therefore, you have to stimulate by means of debt and hope that that will lead to productive activity. But in this case, it, by and large, it hasn't. Um, <clears throat> now, the fact that Evergrande could only grow by taking on more and more debt, obviously, and, and, and is now in crisis because they're not allowed to do so, shows it was inherently unsustainable. <coughs> and in that respect, it's like a microcosm of the latent crisis in Chinese capitalism as a whole, which again has only been able to grow by taking on more and more debt. Um, now, what is going to happen? In the, that's, you know, I've, we've explained what's been taking place, but the real key question is going forwards what's likely to take place. As far as I can see, there's no evidence of a plan to bail out Evergrande, although that may still happen. However, it is unclear if it even can really be rescued. First of all, to do so <clears throat> would be to create what they call moral hazard. In other words, it would incentivize other companies to just continue taking on more and more debt and making reckless investments. Because they would know, if we borrow more money, we'll get bigger, and therefore we'll outcompete our rivals, we'll, we'll capture more market share, and yeah, it might lead to crisis further on, but it's fine because the Chinese state will just rescue us because by then we'll be a huge company, we'll be too big to fail, essentially. That's the thinking, right? And that's why they call it moral hazard. Runaway debt would actually accelerate probably even more quickly than it is now. So that, that, they don't really want to do it for that reason. To bail it out would also be phenomenally complex. Evergrande has about 1.6 million properties that have been sold but they are not finished. They're in the process of being built. The people who have bought them obviously want them, right? And they need them to be finished. And if they're not finished, once again, that will lead to a massive collapse in the property market. Um, but if you're going to bail them out, and if, if you're even going to nationalize them, then you have to figure out how to finish those properties. They're spread out throughout China, throughout about 1,000 different local governments. It will be, be phenomenally complex to organize uh, and plan for those properties to be finished and for, you know, to figure out exactly how that's going to happen. Um, <clears throat> and again, no there's no evidence of any plans being made for this. Furthermore, there's a political dimension to this as well. Xi Jinping is pursuing this policy, which I'll come on and explain more in a moment, for, for political reasons. There's very good reasons for why he's doing this. And he's attempting, as I think you probably know, he's attempting to... Uh, to present himself as basically a friend of the common people against these greedy, reckless capitalists, you know, who are threatening the economy, who are corrupt, etc. And he's really he staked his 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 um, his political fortunes on this. And so then to bail them out, to bail out this reckless, greedy company. By the way, their owner is a notorious figure. He's a, a kind of a poster boy for like anti, you know, anti greed essentially. He was known as Belt Brother uh, because at one point he turned up at a, a Chinese communist event with an incredibly expensive belt, which we, he was showing off. I don't know how much it cost, but he became a kind of figure of hatred in society for that reason. So to then just bail them out, of course, would obviously uh, massively undermine um, the attempt to you know, cut these people down to size, essentially, and to show them that there are consequences to their actions. And also, it's just putting off the evil day. It's just delaying the crisis, isn't it? And everyone knows that, if they bail it out, that is. And we've seen that in the West. We've seen the consequences of bailing out banks, or even whole countries in the EU. It doesn't solve any problems. The debt problem in the West, in Europe, in Greece, in Italy, is as bad as it was, if not worse. No, none of this has really been paid off, despite the years of austerity and all of the bailouts that have happened. Nothing's been solved. And in the next financial crisis, We'll have all the old problems re-emerging and the question of the breakup of the EU, the, the, the collapse of the Greek economy, the Italian economy. They will all re-emerge. Nothing has been solved. And in the process, they have succeeded in creating a stagnant economy, what they call zombie capitalism, because, you know, because all these firms that are unsustainable that should be going bust because of the li liquidity that's been pumped into the economy by the central banks. Uh, over, and, and, you know, the, the quantitative easing that we've seen over the past 10 years. These firms that should have gone bust are unproductive. They've been kept alive because they get cheap credit, basically. Uh, and that has created a stagnant economy, a low productivity economy, which is a big problem for capitalism. That is China's future if they go down that path, and I'm sure the regime knows it. On the other hand, to do nothing 
uh, would crash the economy probably. It would lead to a massive um, collapse in the housing market. And as I've explained, the, the way in which, you know, the size of that and uh, the, de the, the indebtedness and the links to the rest of the economy, I think it would inevitably lead to, lead to a massive recession, of course, which has, also has massive and serious consequences for the regime. So the regime is kind of damned if it does and damned if it doesn't, which, of course, is what happens with capitalist crises. Um, it reveal this crisis reveals the limits of the capitalist system and the end of the period of breakneck growth uh, and, and seeming stability for, Chinese, uh, for the Chinese regime. Now, there are many supporters on the left, well, may, may, maybe many is an exaggeration, there are some supporters on the left uh, throughout the world of, of the regime who basically say <clears throat> that the regime has a decades-long plan to use capitalism or bits of capitalism to build up the economy and to lay the basis for socialism. Because, of course, you need, uh, referring to Marxist theory, you, that seems to be credible, right? You, Marx said you need to have capitalism first before you have socialism. You need to develop an urban economy, a large pr proletariat. And so that's what they've been doing. And Xi Jinping, with his turn to the left and his concentration of power in his hands, he is the one who is going to return China to the planned economy. And in fact, there was even a blog post that was highlighted by the official media in China recently that was sort of hinting that this was happening. And this, the fact that the, the, the state media promoted this blog post and shared it shows that they wanted to encourage that view. Now, <clears throat> if this were correct, and Xi Jinping were a communist, surely this crisis that is taking place now would represent the perfect time to nationalize key sections of the economy, not least Evergrande. It would be the culminating point of decades of capitalist growth, which have succeeded in creating you know, a very, very big working class, the largest in the world, easily, you know, an urban economy, quite an advanced economy in certain respects, one of the most advanced economies in the world. You know? It would be every, all of this, all of the, the, the basis for socialism surely has been laid by now. And now we have a crisis with these greedy, these greedy country, uh, companies who are deeply unpopular in large layers of the population. And Xi Jinping has concentrated un unprecedented power in his hands. It would be the perfect opportunity for him to come in, expropriate Evergrande, expropriate other similar companies, and say, we're moving back to socialism, essentially. But there's no evidence of this at all. There's no suggestion that that is what's going to happen. And in fact, if we look at the energy crisis that's also been afflicting China recently, we can see the opposite movement. So there have been some blackouts in parts of China in recent weeks because the price of coal has gone up so high for various reasons I won't go into. Because the price of coal has gone up so high, there have been blackouts because uh, the energy companies, which operate according to profit, they have a cap on how, by, by law, there's a cap on how much they can charge consumers for energy, so that you know, working class Chinese people can afford to pay their bills, essentially. <clears throat> but because of those price caps and the very high pro price of coal that they have to pay for to power their, their, their power stations, a lot of them just switched their power stations off, didn't buy any more coal and just switched them off, rather than make a loss, because they operate according to profit, they're capitalists. So what has the regime done? Has the regime stepped in and said, that's outrageous, Chinese working class people, they need energy, you're profiteering, we're going to nationalize you. Have they done that? No. In fact, the plan is to liberalize the energy industry in China, to remove those price caps so that working class Chinese people will pay more for their energy. And uh, profits can be made again, and, the, and, and, and we won't see any more blackouts. That is the plan. So there's no evidence of this, this move towards uh, socialism, essentially. Now, <clears throat> to what extent will this crisis should it fully unfold, uh, affect the rest of the world economy? Um, well, I think there's no doubt it will, be, it will have a massive effect. China's corporate debt is 31% of all corporate debt in the world, which is the biggest proportion of world corporate debt, um, which not only shows how much of a, a big chunk of the world economy China now represents, but it also shows how indebted the Chinese economy is if they make up such a vast proportion of corporate debt. A credit crunch in China would have massive ramifications throughout the world. 
<clears throat> now, some say that this won't happen, or at least it won't happen in a particularly bad fashion, because of decoupling. In other words, in the recent period, there's been a lot of protectionist measures. Think of Trump's trade wars with China, you know, the attacks on um, Huawei, uh, blocking Huawei from installing 5G gear in most uh, Western economies. These kinds of things, these tariffs, and et cetera, have kind of separated off China from the rest of the economy, or at least from, from, from Amer America and Europe. So a crisis in China won't affect America or Europe that much, is the thinking. Well, th those developments are very true, and they're very important. Uh, it is profoundly important that there's a rise in protectionism. That has huge consequences for the world economy. Not good consequences, by, by the way. It's a sign of how unhealthy uh, capitalism is that that is happening. Uh, and it tends to drag down GDP globally, in fact, the reduction in trade. However, it shouldn't be overstated. <clears throat> I think it's impossible to decouple China from the world economy. It's far too important now. It's far too deeply enmeshed in the world economy. I mean, it's the second biggest economy. Um, it's the, the, its share of global trade, 13.6%, is the highest in the world. Uh, it represented 28% of all global growth between 2013 and 2018, double the, that of the US. So, you know, it's, it, it's far too important an economy for that to happen in a, in a significant enough way anyway. And in fact, uh, earlier this year in the summer, there was a survey by the European Chamber of Commerce of European companies, European businesses, that found that 60% of them plan to increase their investments into China, up from 51% in 2020. The main reason being, it's more profitable to be in China, and China seemed to have recovered from the pandemic more than other countries, essentially. So you had to be there if you want to make money. Now, I think some of that won't materialize because of the current crisis, and because of the ongoing uh, protectionist measures against China, et cetera. So I'm not saying that this increased investment will necessarily take place, but the fact that that was thought to be the case only a few months ago shows how key, how vital China is for the health of world capitalism, how much of a chunk of the profits that world capitalism makes take place in China. And therefore, again, a crisis in China will have enormous ramifications for the world economy. <clears throat> Decades of, of, of growth in, in, China, in, in the Chinese economy on a capitalist basis have, yes, they have raised living standards. There's absolutely no doubt about that. They've also massively raised inequality. In fact, China was one of the most equal societies in the world back in the 70s. It is now thought to be one of the most unequal societies in the world. In fact, it has a higher Gini coefficient, which is a measure of inequality, than the USA and Britain. It has about as many billionaires as the United States, and it's, it's the equivalent of its parliament, the, China, the National People's Congress, uh, the top 20 members of it, in other words, the equivalent of MPs, the top 20 richest MPs, effectively, in China, are worth $534 billion, right? Far, far richer than the equivalents in the US or in Britain. Over the last year, the Huron Rich List, which is the, rich, the, the list of the richest Chinese people, uh, the wealth of the, of the people on that increased by 24%, right? It is becoming an ever more, despite Xi Jinping's, you know, seeming kind of shift to the left, it's becoming a more and more unequal society. And so it's no surprise that this, these thoughts dominate, they really dog every thought of the regime, which is obsessed with this question of, of, of inequality now. In January, Xi Jinping declared, he said the following, I quote, we cannot allow the gap between the rich and the poor to continue growing. We cannot permit the wealth gap to become an unbridgeable gulf. Comments like these have given him, helped give him something of this reputation for being a communist. I should say that it's not exactly the most radical of statements. We shouldn't allow the gap to keep on growing. We shouldn't allow it to become too bad, essentially, is what he's saying. It's not really a sign it's not really a Leninist call to arms, to be honest. Uh, it's just a sign that they're very concerned about the effects on stability that this will have on Chinese society, and therefore for their regime, essentially. Um, <clears throat> and this has led to a big rise, I think, in class consciousness, although, of course, there's no easy way to measure that, although the website China Labour Bulletin does 
try to measure the, the rate of strikes, and strike, strike rates in China seem to go up all the time. But there does seem to be a profound alienation amongst Chinese people, certainly young Chinese people, quite similar to what we see in the West. I mean, this growth that's been taking place over the last 12 years, for example, thanks to the fiscal stimulus, as I mentioned, yes, it has given out jobs, obviously. It has also raised uh, the cost of living. Some Chinese, big Chinese cities are some of the most expensive cities to live in uh, in the world, and that has created a profound alienation amongst young Chinese people. I don't know if you're aware of this phenomenon of lying flat, uh, which, which spread throughout um, on, on the internet amongst young Chinese people. It's basically an idea of a kind of an expression of hopelessness, essentially, that rejection of the system, but the inability to organize in any way to fight back because of the nature of the regime. And so you have this, this idea of lying flat, in other words, just giving up. You know, they see everything as a rat race, as this horrible kind of rat race to succeed, um, and it's exhausting. Uh, so there's, there's many indications of this, but the biggest indication of it is the response of the regime itself. There is sort of, and I will come on to this in a moment, it is um, you know, presenting itself as to the left, and it's clearly deeply worried about inequality. And that shows, you know, they know what's going on. They study what's going on very, very closely. That shows that there is an enormous amount of discontent. And class consciousness is increased not just by inequality, but by the increase in inequality. And the rate of that increase in China, as compared to any other country, pretty much, is staggering. And there is a perception in China that, you know, this is a communist country, and that our communism has been betrayed, essentially. We have fake communists in charge, um, and, and the rich have gotten rich by foul means, by means of corruption. You know, and it's not just kind of natural, they've been good at their jobs kind of thing, which some people, of course, in, in the West do, do believe. But there is this idea that this is inherently corrupt, um, all of this, this obscene wealth that we have. I also think, I won't go, I don't have time to go into these questions, but I also think that the inequality and the discontent that they, they are worried about is partly behind the tensions with Taiwan. And the other kind of, you know, there's a lot of, I mean, as, as you know, there's a, an enormous amount of, of fear of China, basically, in the West. And the, and the press is obsessed with China, to be honest, and what it's doing in all these countries, and it's, you know, it's military exploits, and it's, you know, it's, uh, it's building islands in, in the South China Sea, it's flexing its muscles. Um, and in particular over Taiwan, with all of these, I don't know if you're aware, but flying planes over Taiwan trying to intimidate the government. This is something that we hear about in the West. It's hyped up. But the way it's described is purely that China's a bully, and China thinks it can get what, it's, what it wants. I think the more important factor is the need to increase national chauvinism as a distraction from the problems at home. They're aware of what's going on. They're aware of the problems in the economy. How could they not be? And they're trying to hype up nationalism and the idea that you know we're on a, a sort of long crusade against the West, who held us down for more than a century, and this is our mission, and you can't give up now, kind of thing. That's the kind of uh, story that they're trying to create, that they're trying to sell to the Chinese people. And I think that's a big, big part of the reason for these tensions, in particular with Taiwan. But on this question of, of, of the regime itself, and the nature of it, and what it's doing, why it's, why it's sort of seeming to make all these sudden uh, left statements or attacking the rich, and what does it mean? Um, I think it's an attempt to maneuver in advance of an outbreak of, of class struggle, of strikes, of mass protests, and to cement, the, to establish the idea that this regime is on the side of the ordinary Chinese people, to cement an advance of such a movement, you know, that we, that we are opposed to the rich, and we're prepared to take action against the rich. That is what they're trying to establish in the minds of of, of working-class Chinese people. I should also say that whilst here we hear about all of these things in a kind of slightly scandalous fashion, you know, the attack on Jack Ma, uh, for example, and, you know, this sort of it all sounds quite dramatic. At the same time, for every attack like this, there is a corresponding reassurance to the bourgeoisie within China that isn't really reported over here. For, exa for example, on the September the 6th, Liu He, the deputy prime minister tried to reassure private business people, and I quote, saying that he said their endeavors were critical to the country's economy. Shortly after the slogan of common prosperity was launched, that is the main kind of policy at the moment 
of Xi Jinping, the idea that we need to build a society that is not too unequal, so we need common prosperity. But shortly after that was announced, the party took the time to reassure the capitalist class uh, that common prosperity will not be achieved, and I quote, by robbing the rich. That's their words, right? That's what they said. We will not rob the rich in order to build common prosperity. So they're attempting to say, basically, yeah, we, we're going to, they're attempting to please two, two classes, essentially, is what they're trying to do. And what this demonstrates is the nature of this regime, which is to say that it is a Bonapartist regime. It's a regime which balances between the classes, essentially. Um, it is not controlled by the capitalist class, like the, the regimes of the West are, although even that has begun to fray in recent years. Um, but they are not really controlled by the capitalist class, but they do defend capitalism. And in fact, many of them are themselves very rich. They are capitalists themselves. But they, the state, the Chinese state apparatus, has a great degree of independence over individual capitalists. And that's because of the way capitalism was introduced into China. It was introduced by the state. The state nurtured and developed capitalism. The Chinese capitalists owe their existence to the Chinese state, which have, you know, has gradually built up into becoming the relatively rich and powerful class that it is today. And that goes back to the nature of Stalinism itself, which Trotsky explained that uh, the, the bureaucracy of a Stalinist regime is not a feature of socialism, but is a threat to it. Because at the end of the day, they are interested in their power and their privileges. That is what they are fundamentally interested in. And therefore, if they are surrounded on a world stage by more rich, more powerful, more technologically advanced countries like the United States or Japan, this would always be a temptation for them. Maybe we can establish similar property rights over here and become rich ourselves. Or maybe we can just open up the economy, economy a little bit to their investment, gain access to their technology, and yes, of course, get a bit rich in the process and make our society more advanced, essentially. That is, or was, what their thinking was. And they thought that they could control the process. I don't think that they necessarily intended to create a full-fledged capitalist economy. I don't think it was necessarily with that degree of foresight. What they wanted was the investment and the technology. And they thought that they could control and master that process. But, you know, this seemingly all-powerful regime is discovering that actually there is something more powerful still, and that is the contradictions of the capitalist economy. That if you develop capitalism, if capitalism becomes the predominant mode of production in your, in your economy, you cannot avoid the crisis of capitalism. You know, if you accept capitalism, you have to accept the laws of capitalism. Now, the regime is obsessed with stability. That is well known. That, that is the, 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 their watchword is stability, stability, stability. And you can see many signs of them attempting to maneuver in advance, as I've explained the recent shift to the left in words at least, and in policy to some extent, is an attempt to do that. There's many other signs of it. In 2015, de Tocqueville's The Old Regime and the Revolution, the famous account of the French Revolution and why it happened, basically, um, was made required reading for all high-ranking party members. What does that mean? Why was that made required reading? Because they are anticipating revolutionary crisis within Chinese society. And they want to prepare for it, or they want to prevent it from happening even, with the right kind of policies. Last year, Xi Jinping also specifically cited Thomas Piketty's Capital, Capital in the 21st Century as a warning to, what, to the consequences of of excessive inequality, right? And they've looked at the experience of the West over the past 10 years and the rise in populism, uh, the polarization of politics, the massive discontent. And they've drawn the conclusion that that's due to the economic crisis, it's due to inequality. And therefore, they, that's a warning sign for us. And we need to move now to correct those things from getting out of control so that we don't get overthrown ourselves. That is essentially what is going on. But as I said, if you accept capitalism, you have to accept the laws of capitalism. There's no magical recipe by means of which you can maintain permanent stability and economic growth under capitalism. Not least because you're in a world economy, so you, there's only so much you can even control, economically speaking, anyway. There is a limit to how much you can, you can do. And yes, you can keep the ball rolling for a while with a fiscal stimulus, but then that will only build up more problems for the future. You cannot 
maintain stability under capitalism forever, and you cannot cancel the class struggle. The class struggle will always reassert itself because capitalism is based upon the exploitation of the working class. <clears throat> so they're walking a tightrope, and they won't be able to, make balance, uh, to, to maintain balance forever. The crisis of capitalism will catch up with the regime. In fact, I would argue it probably already has caught up with it. Um, and that crisis, when it fully blows up, will transform China and, of course, the world. Not just for the past 12 years since the financial crisis, but actually for the past 30 years, the world market has depended upon China. I think that a world crisis of capitalism was delayed because of the entry of China into the world economy. It gave it another lease of life, the cheap labor that could be exploited, you know, and then the growing market that things could also be sold to. That has given capitalism a, a big shot in the arm and kept it going uh, at least until 2008. And then, of course, that crisis, as I said, was limited by thanks to the intervention of the Chinese state in the with the fiscal stimulus. But I think that's used up now. And the, the main point is the future is not going to be like the past. China's not going to have another 30 years like this, and neither will world capitalism. And it's just another sign that we are entering into an era of unprecedented turbulence and class struggle. I'll finish there.